l'heure du moment, c'est le clou du moment, vraiment c'est le big événement. This year of 1968 had repercussions in the most unexpected sectors. Because of the events of May and June, many sporting events couldn't take place the planned days. And that was the case for the 24 hours of Le Mans. Plans for June 15th and 16th had finally taken place on September 28th and 29th, a most unusual date for this great event. A delay of three months did nothing to dampen the interest of the constructors and the enthusiasm of the team. Some Japanese came, a sign that they will have prototypes entered very soon. For three days, complying with the rules, prototypes, sport, and GTs underwent a battery of tests as the perspicacious commissionare verified everything an exam that the Alfa Romeo 2 liter came through successfully. The Italian constructor that has scored several past successes of Le Mans is back this year, renewing with the tradition that had become somewhat forgotten at Alfa Romeo. <laughs> the Alphas are the best Italian hope. Of course, there are five Ferraris here, but officially the constructor isn't represented in prototypes. Ford neither, as the International Sporting Commission has reduced the sport prototypes to three liters. So no more five and seven liter monsters, but engines whose size and fuel consumption are more reasonable and more in European norms. Limiting them to a three liter maximum also had beneficial effects for French constructors. The Alpine Renault are here as every year, but this time with four prototypes with V8 3-liter engines, fine-tuned by Amadie Gordini. For the first time in a very long while, French cars can challenge for the overall success to try and win on distance. If the Alpine Renault 3 liters have ambitions in the distance category, the other Alpine, the 1000cc, 1200cc, and 1300cc, are challenging for the top positions in the energy and performance indexes, as they do every year. The 24 hours of Le Mans now gives another chance for the constructor from Piev to add to another already brilliant list of honors. Jean Redelet can be confident. His team has done everything to get things ready in as small amount of time as possible. The 320 horsepower under the hood is perhaps not enough. The Porsches have 20 more. But Amador Gordini prefers a little less power and more subtleness, allied with minimal fuel consumption. Henri Grancire will drive the 28 with Gerard Larousse. The one leader will be given to René Ligonnet, as a constructor who knows what it's really all about. Jean Redelet doesn't hide his confidence, but sport is hard to predict, and motorsport is full of uncertainties. For all the constructors, the main objective is to be effective. All the cars have been meticulously prepared and tried out in wind tunnels, and they're among the most aerodynamic around. Everything is perfectly controlled, and road handling and power remain essential qualities. Five Fords are at the start. There are five leaders who are competing in the GT category. 
They have 100 horsepower more than the Porsches. They're solid, and they've been put together so well that they're going to be the top competitors in the category. The Ford GT40 number 8 will be driven by the Belgians William Marissé and Jean Blaton, the number 9 by Rodriguez and Bianchi, and the number 11 by Oliver and Muir. Another objective of the 24 Hours of Le Mans is to finish in first place in the World Championship of Constructors. This is the last race that counts in the standings in the World Sports Car Championship. Porsche and Ford are neck and neck at the top. Porsche with 42 points, Ford with 40. If Ford wins, they're world champions. If Ford loses, then Porsche will take the title even if they don't win the 24 hours. While waiting for the big day, it's possible to relax, thanks to the magnificent facilities on the inside of the circuit organized by the Automobile Club. Before such an event, it's essential to relax. These are the drivers and their wives. Their champions entered in a cup, now competing on the eve of the 24 hours of Le Mans. The day has arrived. Saturday, September 28th. The aerodrome next to the circuit sees record numbers arrive. Those who chosen to come by road have made an inspired choice. The weather's splendid, at least for now. And from the end of the morning, we realize the summer spending and the fact that autumn is cooler than June have had no impact on those passionate about automobiles. Le Mans 1968 attracts a huge crowd, and it's not too difficult to stand out. The competitors are silent and discreet. Complying with the rules, their vehicles were in the pits by midday and were filled with fuel between 1 and 2 in the afternoon. The interior is functional. The drivers have no creature comforts, but they do have the best cars one can possibly imagine. The Porsches, as ever, act as a magnet. They're very long, very wide, and very flat. The number 31 did the best time in testing, 335.4 for a lap. That's a bit more than 225 kilometers an hour. There's a Monet with a Simca engine, one of the two Lotus T70s with a Chevrolet engine, as well as the two Corvettes entered in GT. They all stand out. Four categories are up for grabs. Distance, the Energy Index, the Performance Index, and the Index based on cylinders. Apart from the Alpine Renault, another blue car is defending French hopes. The Matra 24 will be driven by Pescarolo and Servoz Gavin. It's equipped with a V12 engine. It was also the first French engine used in Formula One. The cars are ready. It's raining at Le Mans, the track, and raining on the crowd, too, where a group of people climbed up to the grid to come up level with the leading cars. Among the group, Mr. Agnelli, the president of Fiat, who this year will have the honor of lowering the flag in order to launch the 24 hours of Le Mans. It's three in the afternoon, minus a few seconds. The flag has been waved and away we go for the 24 hours of Le Mans. Three Porsches driven by Cifer, Stamelin and Mitter lead the way.
The exact order on the first lap of the lead trail is as follows. The 33 is Stomelin Nierspach. In front of the 31 is Sifer Herman and the 32 Mitter Alford. The track is wet. The cars are moving through the rain and it makes it feel as if there's mist everywhere. The three Porsches control the pace. And watch out for the sands where every year some imprudent drivers spend long minutes against their will. From up close, we see the cars well. But from far away, each of the cars using all that power leave behind plenty of spray. Now to the Ford Chicane, an innovation this year. This while the three Porsches go in front of the stands for the first time. The Ford Chicane, named after the great constructor from Detroit, forces the competitors to decelerate so they go in front of the stands while accelerating. It makes it more spectacular, and it's safer too. You have to go through one by one. If a car messes up, then there is an escape road allowing the car to enter back onto the track via the pits. <laughs> Already a stop for the number 30, a problem with the windshield wipers. All of this happening well back of the three Porsches that are going at a crazy pace the peloton getting more and more scratched. On the Molsan Strait, the power of the cars is at last given free reign, without any limits. Nothing to concern the firemen and the policemen here, but a bit further round, their colleagues have to intervene at lap one. While chasing the Porsches, the Ford GT40 of Marese found itself in a pitiful state. The driver managed to get out and was fortunate. The 31 puts, puts in a lap at 200, 200 kilometers per hour, hour before improving, before improving on, that on that a little later, a little with, later one with one at 204 kilometers per hour. It's said that at Le Mans, the bad weather never lasts for long. It's said that the sun has chased away the clouds never lasts for long. the track is more or less dry. The sun has chased away the clouds and the track is more or less dry. And there's perfect visibility. Never have the pastures been so green and the sky so blue Never have the, the pastures been so green and the sky so the blue after the rain. The 22. And its unique noise has entered here and is somewhat of a curiosity. The turbine-powered Helmet, the 22, and its unique noise is entered here and is something of a curiosity. With the Ford Chicane, there's only one tactic, and that's to follow the well-established racing line. For the Porsches, it's time to refuel, and Mitter hands over the wheel to Milford. Seafair leaves the car to Herman. As for the 33, well, it's spent longer in the pits, 13 minutes to be precise. That's how long it takes to sort out the clutch and to change the fan belt. The drivers don't seem worried for their losing time as the constructor's other two cars now well installed at the head of the field. It's just refueling for the number 12, meanwhile. It's the last time we'll see the 65. 
it comes to a standstill soon after. A pity for the team, as there will soon be other abandonments as the drivers try to follow at a furious pace. Now let's head to the end of the Mulsanne Strait, where generally there's excitement. And it's Muir who's the star, despite himself. He's in the sand for a full 43 minutes. The medical staff is making the most of the entertainment, and that's a good sign. It's spectacular racing, and a great battle in this 24 hours of Le Mans. Here's the Healy 47 of Baker and Hedges, as it had to be abandoned. For their grand return to the big time, Alfa Romeo is going really well, but Porsche is still dominant. Flanks play a big role in automobile racing. Blue, yellow, yellow and red, white green. The significance of each color is well known, but leave the drivers of the Alfa Romeo 65 to be indifferent. The Ford Chicane, and it's worth noting that it's added 8 meters to the circuit, now is a length of 13.4 kilometers. The Chevron 25 abandons when the cylinder head gasket goes. Of the 54 cars that started, four have now fallen by the wayside. With the weather set fair, Joe Siffert ups the tempo and immediately posts a 340.2 at a surprising average for a 3-liter of 220 kilometers per hour. Back to the pits, and going through is the Ford Chicane, where the drivers have learned it's preferable to drop a place or two in trail rather than run the risk of having to take the escape road and pay the consequences for that. The 21 refuels, and it's the Ferrari of Piper and Atwood still loyal to the great annual competition held here in the Sart. At Alpine Renault, they found the formula to have impeccable lights after two hours of racing. Getting into the car is a bit laborious, though. The cockpit of the Alpine 3 liter is pretty narrow. On the 30, the seat used in turn by De Cortanze and Venatier is chained so that they can go through the night in the best conditions. The Howmet 22 turbine is still in the race, but its sister, the 23, is already abandoned. The Alfa Romeos are going well, very well in fact, just like the Matra. This is the worst thing that can happen. Breaking down in the middle of nature. There's nothing left to do but head back to the pits on foot while the rest of the field carry on racing.
The escape road has finally seen some good use, but you need the green light in order to be authorized to get back out onto the track. At the end of the day, it's best to get through with no trouble, like the Porsche and Matra here. Time is passing, and some drivers have already put the lights on. That's when we can appreciate the great idea of using luminescent plates, like they do at Alpine Renault. It's now nearly 8 in the evening, and the sun going down was fatal to the leading Porsches. One after another, they had to give in or fall down the field. All-out attack didn't pay off. The Ford GT40 of Pedro Rodriguez and Lucien Bianchi now lead at the moment that the attractions of the village of the 24 Hours of Le Mans really start to get going. It's a strange village, in fact one that comes to light every year at the twice-around-the-clock event and has pretty well everything that you'd expect. It's here that you can feast on a hot dog or on a full meal or enjoy the entertainment on the numerous stages erected the length of the circuit. The start was more than 10 hours ago, so it's high time we gave you a standings update. The Ford of Rodriguez Bianchi still leads, but the Matra of Cerro Gavin Pescarolo has made a spectacular climb to second. The Porsche 66 is third in front of the Alfa Romeo 39. Two other Porsches follow the 33 of Stamelin and Nierspach, the only car left standing from the initial breakaway. After 15 hours of racing, the Ford GT40 of Rodriguez and Bianchi still lead. Seven laps back, it's the Alfa Romeo 39, followed a lap further back by the Matra. Then come the two Porsches, and the Alpine Renault of Bianchi and Depelier complete the sub six. The day is breaking slowly, and it started to rain again. The track is damp, and the pace has dropped to 193 kilometers an hour on average. Almost half of the cars had to give up during the night, and the remaining cars form a grid that's really stretched out. There are still Porsches, in Alpine Renault, but no more Chevrolet Corvettes. At 1968, it's pretty cold when the spectators wake up. Some learn from the newspapers that the battle at the front is still just as open, that battle's taking place not far away from their tents. From when the spectators wake up, one thing is on their minds, food and drink. And it's easy to tell who had slept well and who has slept badly. What about the racing? Well, it carries on. Matra 24 of Pescarolo and Servo Gavin were engaged in a serious battle for second place with the Alfa Romeo of Junti Gali. For now, the Matra is second, for Pescarolo had to stop to change one of the tires. It's annoying for him, but nothing serious. Back into the pits with the Alfa Romeo Cassani and Biscaldi, still running in the top ten. The Matra has been repaired and is back out there, still running second. The Alpha's filled up and gets going again. 
There are more wrecks than cars left out on the circuit in this most arduous of races. There's always damage done, and the fact that it was cooler this year didn't help more cars stay in. Here's the Alpha of Juti and Gali, chasing the Matra in second place. As for the Alpine of Grandsire and LaRousse, it took too many liberties with the circuit. Meanwhile, the youngsters take part in their own endurance event, the 24 Minutes of Le Mans, a slight modification to the rules compared to the real 24 hours where any driver helped by a third party would be disqualified. It's a very serious race, and now the prizes aren't sweets, but trophies like their elders. They've certainly taken the attitudes, traditions, and movements from their elders. It's often said that the 24 Hours of Le Mans is a world rendezvous for all those interested in automobiles. It seems that this year, those passionate about the cars have come from far and wide to watch the 36th edition. The museum is doing brisk business. More than a visit, it's a real pilgrimage when you come in order to see what the first car was in the family. There's an incident well, to signal an incident in the to signal at Tetra Rouge. The at Tetra Rouge. A car's, a gone, car's off gone off and, and it's caught fire. fire. It's the Alpine Renault 27 of Mauro Bianchi and Patrick Depaye. The, the, the Belgian Mauro Bianchi was at the wheel here. The Belgian Mauro Bianchi was at the wheel here. Some light burns Fortunately, to the hands and face. injuries weren't too bad. Some light burns to the hands and face. This driver must consider himself lucky. It's just at the time when the spectators are reveling in the spectacular racing that they learn that the Matra 24 is no longer in the race. The Matra is abandoned a bit after Mozan. A tire quite literally blew up about three hours from the checkered flag. It's a stupid way for things to come to an end. Pescarolo treats the news serenely and knows the game's up. There are only 22 cars left, but hundreds of clients in the restaurants on the circuit. There are no abandonments to signal, just a few quarters after eating in a short night. Three hundred thousand spectators who are in attendance officially were as surprised as Sperry and Steinman to find out that the Porsche sixty six had moved up to second place overall. The sun is back for the finish of the last of the twenty four hours. Despite having been postponed three months, this has been an excellent addition. 54 cars at the start, 20 still in and out in the end. In the pits, lessons are already being taken on board as weaknesses are assessed towards the conclusion of this most grueling of events.
At Tête La Rouge, this is the scene. The Alpine Renault 30 of Vinatière de Cortanze is in eighth place in front of three other Alpines. While seriously petite, the blue cars can't talk to themselves with great valor. Five of them make it to the finish out of 15 cars to be classified. Rodriguez and Bianchi still lead, and this time they'd see it through to the finish. The Alphas take fourth, fifth, and sixth just behind the Porsche Stamelin and Nierspach, the only survivor from the blast at the start line the previous day. It's over, and at the wheel of the Ford GT40, the Mexican Pedro Rodriguez and the Belgian Lucien Bianchi have won the 36th edition of the 24 Hours of Le Mans. The distance covered? Some 4,452 kilometers. They triumph in front of two Porsches, three Alphas, a Ferrari, and four Alpine Renaults. Of 19 cars at the finish line, only 15 are classified. The last four hadn't covered enough distance. Rodriguez, at 28, has already had an exceptional career, and 34-year-old Lucien Bianchi would be competing this 13th time at Le Mans. Also claiming honors, the Alpine Renault of Nicholas and Andouet first on the performance index in front of an Alpha and a Porsche. And at last, honors for the 52, another Alpine, first on the energy index. Flowers, compliments, spray. Another great event is starting for the heroes of the party. It always finishes with a party, whether you're on the top step of the podium or not. After all, most of the entrants don't get on it. And this is the great party that is the 24 hour of Le Mans. The great party of the automobile. Les 24 heures, les 24 heures, les 24 heures.